Good morning and welcome to our webinar for today, How Has COVID-19 Reshaped Commercial Green Buildings? My name is Fatma Al-Bastaki and I am from Dubai Chamber Center for Responsible Business. As we all know, green buildings has been a major um, focus of the Emirate of Dubai and this is evident in, in what we see in strategies, policy, regulations, uh, specifications, etc. be it for new buildings or for existing buildings that are being uh, retrofitted. So um, until 2019, and according to Etihad ESCO, we had more than 7,000 buildings in Dubai alone that were retrofitted and completed. This has led, environmentally speaking, to the reduction of CO2 emissions by more than 130,000 tons. Indeed, this is a great amount of uh, CO2 reduction to be done only from the built environment. However, when it comes to green buildings, we don't only focus on environment benefits that we reap out of it. We also focus on economical and social values as well. So uh, with that, we maintain the triple bottom line while also ensuring sustainability uh, of the buildings, of the community and of uh, Dubai as an emirate. Uh, later, when COVID-19 hit, we can see that um, the health and well-being of building occupants became an important factor that we all focused on. So aside from uh, the COVID-19 preventative measures that we all know, such as social distancing, um, sanitization, wearing masks, we also focused on uh, ventilation and indoor air quality. And uh, we, we maintained the health and well-being of building occupants in that regard. Uh, today in our webinar, we have a number of great speakers lined up with us who will be um, handling this topic. First, we will start on a macro level where we will listen to a presentation on uh, the demand side management strategy of Dubai 2030 and its recent updates, as well as the future market of retrofitting in Dubai. And then we will listen to another presentation on the research findings that were done globally on uh, the health and well-being of building occupants during COVID-19. And uh, later on, we will listen to another presentation on the latest technologies when it comes to indoor air quality. And some of these technologies were actually locally made. And uh, last but not least, we will uh, hear some uh, real life examples on some buildings that were uh, implemented or green building projects that were implemented during the pandemic. So, um, before we start, let us uh, do one poll that uh, I will launch just now. Please take a minute to do this poll about your awareness of the demand side management strategy of Dubai and especially the recent updates. Let's take a minute. All right, thank you for taking the poll. So these are the results. As we can see, most of them, most of the attendees are not aware of this um, strategy. And that is why we have with us Mr. Faisal Ali Rashid, Senior Director, Demand Side Management at uh, Dubai Supreme Council of Energy. Mr. Faisal is greatly experienced in energy management, including the supply and demand side, as well as in strategies. He has a strong background in handling industrial plants, such as those of oil and gas, power and water generation, and material handling processes. He currently looks after the energy demand management spectrum in the Emirate of Dubai. Mr. Faisal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fatma, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'll uh, speak. Uh, as uh, Fatma said at the micro, micro level, I think it's important to basically to address the, the energy aspect, uh, energy management at uh, uh, macro level and then share it with the different stakeholders uh, so they can understand where the government is heading in terms of, uh, uh, I think the whole energy management 
spectrum and so with a focus on the demand side management. So I'll, uh, I'll just uh, like to uh, start uh, uh, by saying that we often, uh, I mean, too often we see government appreciate the role of energy uh, demand uh, uh, reduction, uh, which can play a major role in managing our energy system. Yet uh, the measure uh, that reduce demand and contribute to a more cost-effective way uh, to meet our energy and climate goal uh, than the supply investment in capital for projects. So we always look at the demand size management uh, as, the, as a priority when it comes to reducing energy, uh, uh, rather than looking at the supply and then continue to build and expand our energy infrastructure for water and uh, and uh, also for uh, uh, electricity generation. So uh, having said so, uh, DSCE, the Vice President Council of Energy, takes pride in making DSM the center uh, of the key uh, government policy framework uh, as we started this in 2010, and we already have established a working system. Um, we establish uh, a governance structure, structure, we have a reporting structures, we have an intervention means as well. And we're very happy to see this happening at the national level, which is already announced uh, uh, recently. And definitely the SM is without a question, it's a big topic. It some, sometimes doesn't get enough attention, but it's growing uh, significant, uh, significantly because of many factors. It creates job, it creates uh, green procurement, it's, uh, it's improved the air quality, uh, it reduces greenhouse uh, gas emission, and, and so on. And next, please. So I've already spoke about the national uh, DSM strategy announced by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed as a Prime Minister of uh, UAE. So we're very happy to, to see this happening and collaborate uh, with, the, with the national, uh, I think, uh, ministries uh, uh, to achieve the common goal for uh, our local strategy as well as uh, for the UAE strategy. Next, please. Uh, so uh, the, uh, in Dubai and the UAE, there are a series of local and national policy plan all have been formulated uh, basically to address energy security, to address uh, energy efficiency, to address uh, clean energy. Uh, all these respective national plan have to make sense economically to us. Uh, that's why we have a, a mechanism to evaluate each program as we go, uh, as we continue our journey. Uh, policies and strategy are key enabled to our initiative. They provide uh, uh, basic guideline and periodical uh, target for uh, energy efficiency or renewable energy, and also greatly accelerate the optimization of so social resources, allocation, circular economy, and also improving the market. So usually when we talk about energy or we refer to energy and analysis, we can categorize it in three aspects, clean energy and reliable energy, and also uh, cheap energy. Uh, uh, it seems uh, that we all agree uh, that we need all of them, but sometimes we differ on priority and precedence. Um, but for example, environmentals uh, want, want clean energy, economists want cheap energy, and national uh, security want reliable energy. So we all have a piece of that, but there's a trade-off where it is really hard to have some time all of uh, these things. So my broader texture on this is uh, uh, we have to have a better choices uh, in terms of resources, in terms of uh, uh, sustainability, in terms of uh, cost as well, and then we make a decision and we draw our uh, map. And uh, also adding to this clean energy policy is a global issue. It requires uh, not only Local effort is, it requires uh, international coordination. There is an interest group uh, that can benefit from clean energy. And also there are some interest groups that can uh, uh, maybe not benefit from uh, the uh, uh, clean energy policy. But I think uh, the debate uh, is going toward environment.
environment more than the economy because we continue to okay reduce the cost of DSM and efficiency as we as technology advances. Next, please. And uh, also in uh, uh, in uh, Dubai we have. Uh, uh, main guiding principle, which is the bio-integrated energy strategy. And within this, we have many uh, flagship or many uh, side strategy. All of them, I think they address the same goal, but with more detail. We have the bio-clean energy strategy, which basically uh, uh, mandating us to increase the penetration of renewable energy 25% by 2030, 75% by uh, 2050, and also we have the manage management, which basically uh, reduces the uh, calls for reduction of uh, energy consumption by 30% versus business as usual in 2030, and also integrated water uh, resources strategy, which basically uh, increase uh, or moving us from from fragmented approach to a more integrated approach, uh, looking at all sources of water groundwater, uh, treated water, as well as desalinated water. And also we have a green mobility strategy, which basically addressing increasing penetration of uh, EV and hybrid on the horizon 2025 and 2030. And also carbon ab abatement strategy, which basically uh, calls for reduction of carbon uh, abatement uh, or carbon uh, footprint uh, of Dubai. Uh, next, please. Uh, so uh, before I talk about the DSM house, I just want to say the uh, uh, the, uh, the energy efficiency can be very difficult. Uh, uh, improving it can be very difficult. It's, it it's just uh, it's not limited to policy making only. It requires collaborate collaboration with uh, uh, government entities. It requires collaboration with private entities. It is. Uh, uh, academic uh, uh, community engagement as well as part of it, and uh, the I think all these things basically translate into changing the behavior of many stakeholders, uh, uh, like commercial building, like uh, residential building, public building, and factories as well industries. Uh, they all basically uh, connect the production. Uh, and the measure that we don't take today, I think it will help us uh, in terms of expenditure in the future. So if we don't uh, increase the efficiency of our building, I think uh, we will basically continue to uh, consume higher energy. So if it's uh, if we're five years late, late in doing this, we know that, that we have lost the opportunity. If it's more than same thing. So what I'm displaying, I'm displaying now is a DSM house, basically, which basically represent uh, our true, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a summary charter of our true goal and ambitions. And within this, we have a whole, uh, we have list of program, we have responsibility matrix, we have a target for each program, we have a scope for each uh, program. We have also governance structures in terms of committee that is uh, uh, looking after this program. We have an intervention mean, we have a reporting, uh, also annual reporting, which basically calculate and display our uh, consumption um, uh, and our saving every year. And uh, I'd like to say also this uh, journey has been a successful journey since we started in 2010. There are many directives that have been issued. There are many capital investments that have been issued. There are many uh, new policies that decreased, and uh, there are many aware awareness also uh, elements that were part of this. All of them, I think, they were they have contributed to the saving that we are basically reporting uh, every year and so on. I, I'd like to say also, uh, uh, building uh, is uh, a key part of our program. I think all the program or mostly are linked to building. So whatever we we basically uh, uh, treat, uh, whether it is existing building, whether, whether it is a new building, I think uh, it will benefit, uh, benefit us in the future. So if we compare investment in energy efficiency in a building to investment in uh, capital on the supply side, we, 
look at, at every mathematical chart and we realize that investment uh, or investing in energy efficiency in a building will uh, cost uh, uh, a lot lower. And also, the lead period uh, for the energy efficiency project is a lot shorter than the supply side. So without a doubt, I think uh, uh, this uh, is, uh, is the way forward for us. In terms of, uh, uh, I would say, COVID-19, I'd like just to uh, focus on the title of the project. Uh, what we have benefited, I think, uh, uh, especially when we talk about building, I think working at home or working from home became a trend and more adaptable during COVID-19 lockdown. And even after, I think uh, it can be said that uh, this work style can be very beneficial for, for some type of work. Uh, could be for, for a meeting, for a presentation, for uh, any type of meeting, board meeting or advisory meeting. Uh, this is what we have uh, adopted during this period, even after this period. And it, it, uh, it can, uh, without a doubt, it can reduce the emission from tra transport because of the traps that uh, I think uh, individual make, you know, to attend meeting. It's been uh, beneficial from this aspect. Uh, also, there was a heavy, de heavy demand and the digital solution uh, by many professional industries for, uh, as I said, for conducting meeting and presentation and uh, uh, making virtual events and so on. Uh, so this work style have given us, have given the community uh, more confidence in dealing with future disruption and future crisis. So there is always a, sort of a way to meet, a way to connect, a way to I think to take measures, to take decision uh, without maybe uh, coming to office or attending uh, uh, physically. Also, uh, I can say um, um, investing in energy efficiency and demand side management has always been considered, uh, considered positive towards sustainability. Uh, I can basically state that having more efficient uh, uh, building would have reduced the cost of the capital investment on the supply side, without a doubt. So our uh, strategy very much uh, uh, stands uh, basically firm on the necessity of uh, uh, the national plan and the local plan that we have for demand side management. Um, so more efficient building definitely would have uh, uh, I mean, uh, our operating um, capital costs for the supply side that have been invest invested, I think, would have been a lot lower because during the pandemic, I think, you know, the capacity of uh, uh, the generation uh, went uh, definitely lower, uh, especially for commercial building. We know that for residential, it went a bit higher. For commercial building and for public building, it went lower because most of the people were working from home. Last thing also I would like to say that uh, the, the aspect of net zero energy building, the net zero energy building would make any building more independent. And this is something that we will look at in the future. It will make building more into, uh, independent to some degrees. Uh, and uh, it will have less impact uh, by unforeseen outcome on the supply uh, side, which could uh, happen during uh, crisis. Next, please. Uh, uh, one of the main programs that uh, we have in Dubai is part of the DSM program is building retrofit program. So the, the investment made uh, in this program since, since we started in 2016, I think more than 2 billion, and the saving is uh, double, uh, more than 2 billion uh, dirham, and the saving is double uh, this uh, amount. So we're moving uh, forward positively to make it building a healthy uh, retrofit market, a more uh, uh, scale uh, level uh, of uh, retrofit. And more. So, um, thanks to the government uh, for making the policy for initiating this. And thanks uh, to the private ESCO uh, who basically contributed to have led this initiative by implementing many projects uh, by, whether it is for public building, whether it is for commercial building. And as you can see in this uh, slide, uh, the market is, uh, uh, the, the saving of electricity, which we're counting is increasing year by year from 2016 to 2000, 
19 or that, that I'm display, displaying, the investment is also is uh, uh, increasing. And also num number of accredited ESCO. Uh, I think market is part of it, you know, and Dubai part, part of what we do here in Dubai Supreme Council Energy will ensure that we, uh, we have uh, uh, accred accreditation mechanism for uh, ESCO so they can work uh, with the government building, with commercial building, uh, when they involve in, and this will give confidence to this uh, developer and stakeholder when they engage with the uh, uh, private ESCO. Next, please. And uh, within this program, uh, we understood that cooling basically uh, consume more than maybe 60 or 65 percent of uh, building uh, uh, consumption um, and building consume 80 percent of uh, power generation usually. Uh, lighting uh, uh, also consume maybe 15 percent, but uh, how we translated that into uh, when we address this building retrofit project, uh, uh, that the retrofit that basically uh, been done on cooling represent around 60% and lighting uh, 33%. So for lighting, I think we know that it's a low hanging fruit. I think you can get the, the return very fast. It could be one year or so. For cooling, it could be more like three years. But this is how we address the, the building retrofit project by looking into the component a building system, which one will uh, will basically uh, which one is responsible for higher consumption? You know, it is cooling. That's why most of the retrofit basically address cooling, upgrading, whether you replace a chiller, whether you uh, you uh, work on the insulation, and so on. And of course, uh, the payback period for these projects have to be uh, favorable. I think uh, we have to have a model that is attractive to. Uh, the end user when they uh, basically enter this project. We have big end user like Dubai Airport, like uh, Dubai Free Zone. They have done a huge pro project and they benefited from, from the project. Uh, they have uh, achieved the saving as well uh, by adopting this model. And then we also have many other projects uh, uh, where, where, which we're basically monitoring and uh, reporting. Next, please. Uh, also, uh, we, uh, uh, I think, uh, complementing the building retrofit project, we have a facility management, it's a new program, facility management energy accreditation scheme, I think, for facility management uh, companies, uh, uh, an in-house uh, team to demonstrate strong track record of energy efficient, efficiency facilities, uh, uh, management of building in Dubai. So this one, this uh, scheme, will address uh, operation, uh, operation and also for performance of, of a building. So uh, by having, by designing a building uh, uh, in line with the energy efficiency element, I think you have to also to ensure that the building is performing efficiently. So that's why we have built this uh, scheme accreditation to ensure that facility management also uh, support this uh, whole energy efficiency and, uh, reduction in, in building. Also, we have uh, we know that uh, district cooling in, in, have been deployed in, in Dubai for a long period, more than 15 years or so, and they have brought benefit because uh, they are more, more efficient than the traditional co cooling. And uh, building on this and uh, um, trying to increase the penetration of district cooling in Dubai, which already stand as 25 percent share. Uh, of cooling comes from this cooling. We have also uh, built a new, uh, basically, platform, uh, this cooling association uh, for our operator for the district cooling main pro provider, basically. So we have a committee uh, to address uh, uh, the increased penetration of uh, district cooling across Dubai. So we can increase the efficiency also of the, the energy as a whole. Uh, next, please. And uh, another program I want to also just give you some brief is the solar rooftop program. It's also part of the energy efficiency reduction program. And this is move 
coming uh, gradually and slowly. And as you can see that we have uh, uh, we continue to make saving, uh, uh, saving 2020 uh, uh, was 240 gigawatt hour versus the uh, previous year, which is 142 gigawatt hour. And we're very close to our target uh, 2020. 2020, which is uh, 244. Uh, next, please. And uh, what comes next, I think, on the horizon uh, is uh, the thing that we're working on, uh, or we don't have today, is to uh, is introducing a building rating scheme for both for existing building and also for uh, new building. Uh, uh, which basically given a star rating, silver and bronze, I mean, bronze, silver and gold and platinum, but different type of buildings. This is uh, one scheme that we're working on and we're finalizing. And also, as I mentioned, the facility, man facility management accreditation schemes also has been launched. And uh, for awareness purpose also, we have developed a DSM play playbook for individual market segment whether it's for commercial building, starting with, and then could be for a public building and also for residential building. Um, also, we leverage uh, global R&D advancement for smart building uh, retrofit, applying a more feasible aspect of net zero energy building, smart appliances and so on. With this, I'd like to stop here and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Faisal, for taking us through this insightful presentation on your uh, different programs that you have, including Efficient Cooling, Shemp Spray, uh, and other programs as well. So thank you for shedding the light on these. And as you rightly said, COVID-19 has made us more confident now in that uh, we can achieve resource efficiency by using technology and uh, reducing our consumption of resources by being available in the buildings uh, in our offices. So uh, this is definitely an important highlight. And it's great to see that despite the pandemic, there has been a recent updates on the strategy. This shows the resilience of the strategy uh, despite the challenges that are happening. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, if we have any questions from the attendees, please feel free to ask um, right now in the Q&A box before we move on to our next presentation. Any questions are welcome for the first presentation. All right, so thank you very much once again, Mr. Faisal. Thank and, you. Um, My pleasure, thank you. Uh, I think we've got one um, question on any specific controls in place to ensure cooling providers act responsibly. So I'm not sure if this can be covered under your uh, district cooling program. No, I think this is a technical question. It's not linked to a strategy or uh, what I have addressed. Okay, but we're, we're looking at it from micro level. Uh, we ensure from this, uh, uh, I think, committee to ensure that we have a, a more efficient uh, uh, district cooling plant uh, when they connect to building. Uh, that's uh, to, to have a standard. Uh, uh, the cooling plant, and then also to ensure that more building in the future will connect uh, uh, to the district cooling, especially when we have uh, plant and capacity available. We know we have some surplus capacity. So when, when a building basically uh, uh, reaches its uh, end of uh, uh, life uh, of chillers, uh, so there is always an opportunity if it's 15 years or so and so, instead of you know, maybe paying capital, the big capital to whether it is a hotel, whether it is a shopping mall, I think it's, all, it's always good to evaluate the option of connecting to uh, district cooling. Thank you, Mr. Faisal. 
We will now move on to our next uh, presentation for today. Uh, we have four speakers and uh, their knowledge partners, Etheram and Intertech. We have with us Mr. Vibor Batnagar, Senior Engineer, Energy Sustainability and Technical Services at Circo Middle East. Mr. Vibor is experienced in energy management, project management, and facility engineering. He has a cumulative experience of more than seven years in the sectors of power, oil, and gas, and consulting and business development services. He also holds several certifications in the area of green buildings. We also have with us Mr. Tim, Sefton, Managing Partner at Iteram. Uh, Mr. Tim has over 40 years of experience regionally and globally in delivering project cost and support services. He has also worked on several projects globally and locally. Uh, we also have with us Mr. Michael Horn, Principal Microbiologist and Mr. John Downey, Regional Manager Building Sciences at Intertech. Uh, Mr. Ta Mr. Michael Horn has over 16 years of experience in oil and gas, hospitality, and industrial industries. He has a solid background in microbiology, including onshore, offshore, and Legionella management services. Mr. John has more than 20 years of experience in the fields of construction, building envelopes, and packets. So with these speakers, we are moving on to our next presentation for today. Over to you. Oh, thanks, Fatma. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. As a lead member of the Green Buildings Task Force, Circo has taken this uh, very good opportunity to speak on the emerging and developing issues of COVID effects on health and well-being of building occupants, along with its knowledge partners, Intertech and ITRON. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Fatma. Uh, here we can see a COVID response timeline uh, after COVID was declared a pandemic. In March 2020, WHO raised the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, disease to the pandemic level. Till March 2020, both WHO and CDC were insisting that the COVID pandemic is transmitted primarily through respiratory droplets and fomites alone, and it is not airborne. Now, fomites are objects and surfaces which act as uh, intermediaries for transmitting infection. Now that changed when Austria released its position statement in April 2020, suggesting that the COVID-19 is airborne, uh, a very likely possibility. In fact, 36 air quality experts had written to uh, WHO there itself, uh, suggesting that the uh, COVID-19 has gone airborne, but the WHO was not convinced. Only in July, when uh, 239 scientists wrote a joint letter to WHO. WHO acknowledged it's uh, airborne. It's, uh, the COVID-19 is airborne. Last month, ASHRAE updated its position stating that COVID uh, airborne transmission is significant. Just 12 hours ago, ASHRAE has released a very strong statement in support of filtration and ventilation being adopted as the primary measures for combating COVID-19 in buildings. Following which, uh, again, in March uh, 2021, the WHO has released a roadmap on indoor air ventilation. Next, please. Now, this is a case study from Seoul, South Korea, of a COVID outbreak. Now, as you can see in the picture, is a floor map of the 11th floor on which the outbreak took place. The blue positions are the infected positions. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, no, uh, I mean the previous one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the investigation identified that in spite of considerable interaction and movement within the building, the infection was almost exclusively limited to the, to the 11th floor, meaning in spite of movement of people and interaction in the elevators lobby, the, the infected cases were primarily from the 11th floor, that too from one area. Now, which suggested that uh, exposure time is a key factor in transmission. The primary infected person was from that area. Is my voice not audible? It is audible, yes. Okay, moving on uh, to case study, the second case study, which is a COVID outbreak in a poorly ventilated restaurant. Now, this case study is from uh, a restaurant which was part of a uh, commercial office building. 
uh, with not sort of schem uh, schematic arrangement is shown in the picture. As you can see, the primary infectant A1. Uh, I mean, because of the air streams that are being, uh, because of the poor ventilation and the air streams, the infection was passed on from table A to B and C. Now, the, exp uh, the exposure time in, in these two cases was quite high, 53 and 73 minutes. And the air outlet and the return air inlet were located directly above C, table C. Can you please move on? Next slide, please. Now, as the research, as the investigation uh, showed, the, in the case, this was a case of a building which was centrally conditioned, five floors. The incident took place as at the third floor. There were five final con units in the, in the third floor, but the ventilation rate was quite poor. In fact, it was 0 0.7 liters per second, which is way lower than the ASHRA recommended ventilation rate of seven liters per second. Uh, the, the majority of the air that was recirculated or used in the building was was the the previously used air. I mean, which is which is the recirculated air itself. Now, no one else at the restaurant fell in, or the staff fell in. Only the people in the direct contact of the airstream fell fell in. The poor ventilation led to high viral load buildup in the confined space. Next, please. Now, these are some of the news news clippings that you might have come across. These are the three clippings from Gulf News and BBC covering them. Now, why was COVID, the mortality rate of India, such a mystery? India, make no mistake, India has one of the highest infection rates, but India's mortality rates was one of the lowest. Now, which led to speculations regarding what, what, what exactly were the reasons behind it? Next, please. Now, there were multiple debates, counter debates, and then some more debates regarding it. Factors, um, I mean, some of them identified were effective preemptive lockdown. Uh, then we had undetected fatalities, which were in most of the, in many countries were being reported. Herd immunity, uh, had India achieved a level of herd immunity that, uh, that basically decreased its infection levels. Some of them are even suggesting that India has a very pandemic resilient medical infrastructure. India has a very good industry of medical tourism worldwide. Uh, nobody knew the answer. So th this was a paper which was published by Dr. Sham Agrawal and Shreyas Agrawal uh, from Sriram Ganga Health Hospital in Delhi, New Delhi. They suggested that the high viral load and poor ventilation were, were, the, were the main causes of high mortality from COVID. It wasn't just the exposure time, it was the high viral buildup. In the in the uh, in the enclosed space, and can we have the next clippings? And they suggested that the centralized heating and cooling system were the main factors. Probably this this viral load builds up much more easily in uh, developed countries as opposed to developing economies. Next, please. Now, India major in the majority of the households in India are naturally ventilated equipped with ceiling fans. Now, ceiling fans play a very major role in uh, improving air mixing, circulation, and cost ventilation. The, these were the first line of defense for any Indian household. Simply turn on the air, let the uh, open the windows, let the, atmosphere, uh, let the uh, surrounding ventilate. Now, for cooling purposes, mostly desert coolers, split window air conditioning systems were utilized as opposed to centralized air conditioning. Now, we are talking about these are residential households. In commercial buildings, of course, we have to resort to centralized air conditioning. Uh, next, please. Now, WHO released its indoor ventilation guidance, in which the first line of defense it measures, uh, it suggests is just open the windows and um, just ventilate. Try to have mental, uh, natural ventilation as more, as much um, as much as possible. Then it's suggested uh, using uh, pedestal fans, even in uh, non-residential settings. Then having air extractors, whirly birds, other sort of uh, construction constructions for improving the stack effect of uh, natural ventilation. Standalone uh, air cleaners with MOV 14 F8, which is the uh, European or the British equivalent filters as a, dilu as a dilution strategy for the contaminants uh, to achieve proper mixing using fans, fan coil or split AC was suggested. Next, please. Now, this is the operational guidance we have been following, operational uh, readiness 
we have been increasing the uh, outdoor air ventilation to the extent possible, disabling the CV, opening the air dampers to 100%, uh, using the upgraded filtration to MOV 14. WHO suggests that Ashray is saying uh, uh, MOV 13 is fine, keeping systems running for longer hours, 24 7 where feasible. In cases where 24 7 is not feasible, Ashray suggested that. Uh, prior to the opening of the facility, two hours of 100% uh, damper level should be or should be used, and two hours after that, to basically flush out the stagnant air in the systems. Uh, then using uh, portable air cleaners with HEPA or high MOV filters, using portable ultraviolet germicidal infection devices. In connection to high density areas, bypassing energy recovery ventilation systems, which might potentially leak contaminated exhaust here back into space. Uh, next, please. Uh, we, have, we have also been using BPI, which is bipolar ionization, which is also referred to as non-thermal plasma technology on a needle point BPI. Here, the cleaners uh, basically generate uh, negative, and ion, uh, negative and positive ions, which are released into the airstream to create reactive ions. Now, these ions cling themselves onto the airborne contaminants such as uh, particulates, viruses, bacteria, volatile matter, volatile organic, organic compounds, making them heavy so that they drop out of the air. Now here's a picture which is illustrating the same. We have the plasma bar which is releasing the uh, negative and positive ions in the atmosphere and which is clinging on to the uh, contaminants before flowing into the supply space. Next please. Now over to our knowledge partners. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, be included in this presentation. Uh, I'd just like to um, introduce uh, the, the points that we're going to um, cover in our uh, presentation. Um, just in answering the objectives of the webinar, which was to raise awareness of the impact of COVID, to address the future of the commercial green buildings post-COVID and to understand the future of the uh, commercial green buildings in Dubai and what they will look like going forward. In, in answer to those objectives, we want to talk about the importance of the external envelope of buildings and the performance of those aspects in relation to being able to give a safe and uh, a pleasant working environment. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, air quality in, in the internal environment and how that uh, is paramount again in relation to uh, the protection uh, against uh, potential future COVIDs and um, viruses, bacteria and pathogens. Uh, also into uh, a certain amount into the internal surfaces with the, the makeup, the built fabric of an internal office of, an inter of, a, of, a, of a green building um, and, and the importance of uh, maintaining uh, all of those aspects to provide a um, quality, safe working environment under the uh, under the auspice of um, occupational health and safety. Uh, and then finally, um, we uh, in relation to uh, the second objective, um, we believe that, uh, as was uh, intimated by uh, one of the previous guests, that um, a, we should develop um, a commercial building code. Uh, similar to that that's operated in the hotel and hospitality industry where commercial buildings are rated not only for the, the kind of stuff that is already intimated but to introduce into that rating some other aspects as a result of the lessons learned from the current pandemic. Um, and then finally, uh, what the green buildings look like in the future. Uh, we strongly believe that the, the advent of building science should be included very early in, uh, in, the, in the discipline of design and, um, and subsequently, uh, you know, that will, uh, will reduce the amount of retrofit in, in years to come, having uh, learned the lessons and introduced those lessons uh, via building science and also including building science in the day-to-day -day management and operations of a building um, to ensure one, that it's, uh, when it's audited to maintain its uh, rating um, and also to ensure that it's a safe uh, working place for everybody who would attend that commercial building. I'll now pass you over to Mike Horn, who will lead us through the uh, ITRIM uh, Intertech um, slides. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Tim. So as you saw from the previous slide, I had a good chance to read through it, so I won't uh, go back over it, but some research done across the market and through our customers in um, 2020 following the, the pandemic and the initial lockdown with many people working from home was that, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, fear amongst uh, both management employees about returning to work and there's a requirement that from, from both employers, residential managers, commercial managers to ensure that buildings that we're going to be potentially returning to workplaces are uh, properly managed at health and safety you know, from a, a hygiene and a disease perspective is, is taken into account along with the standard health and safety. Now, the way that, that we look at that probably you know, from, from several disciplines is both, as Vipar touched on, surface hygiene, air quality hygiene within a building, a building probably prior to the pandemic, things that we took for, for granted, things that we never considered, you know, just is the air conditioning working? Is it hot enough? Is it cold enough? And, you know, did you ever think twice about opening a bathroom door and walking into a toilet about washing your dishes in the sink or washing your cup in the sink when you went to make a cup of tea um, at break time, that these start to become um, much more important than they, they possibly ever have been and, and will remain that way for the, for the foreseeable future. And then, of course, the, the building itself as a functioning structure, the design, the operation and the maintenance of it. And of course, as Tim touched on, the science of both of those. So have an effective validation in place to make sure the monitoring proactive approaches to, to a building, whether that building is a, an office, a school, a hospital, each of these should have a, a proactive approach to it and that may extend to you know, varying levels of requirements that might differ between the different facilities. So next slide, please. So first of all, and as the initial um, guidance in, indicated, surface hygiene, which was you know, leading us all to, to buy uh, huge quantities of hand sanitizers and make sure that everything we touched was, was clean in between use that, you know, there is um, a significant part of a building which has high traffic touch points. You think about any one building that you may enter and how many people have touched things like door handles, elevator buttons, taps, toilet handles, um, all these different areas. So of course, before people return to work, this may be the ideal opportunity for us to look at ways that we can engineer those particular areas out, such as installing automatic doors, um, or aut automatic taps, um, even within our laboratories, replacing the fingerprint scanners for additional or alternative means, such as eye scanners, or you know, even going back to manual doors. And, and potentially as well with, with um, uh, new developments looking at self-cleaning replacements. So there is uh, organizations, companies that can offer um, surfaces which can be, which can have films on them, which can have uh, toxic or antimicrobial components such as copper and silver impregnated into them. So uh, these may remain cleaner for longer with the right, uh, with the right management put in place. It also leads us to look at, and I'll touch on it probably uh, possibly in the next slide, um, increased excellence in our cleaning regimes. So what we have in place at the moment, the routine cleaning programs, the, the staff that are there, the competence of the cleaning staff, you know, is that something that you've looked at within your building, within the staff that you have? Are they adequately trained? Are the chemicals they're using industry recognized? Are they diluting them to the correct concentrations or are they extending the the life of those chemicals by you know perhaps over diluting. Also, and I think something that we've never thought about uh, prior to this is looking at planning for emergencies. You know, what do you do in the event that someone in your organization falls ill or in your building falls ill with coronavirus? How do you approach the cleaning, the isolation of that individual, and then of course of the environment that they've been in once they've been removed from it? And of course, how do you have any confidence in that cleaning? How do you evaluate the effectiveness of it? And then of course, looking at the hygiene of the building users themselves, individual responsibilities, making sure that individuals are properly trained in hand sanitation, cleaning uh, their hands after the use of toilets. Even the disposal of PPE is an important part of um, clean building management. So making sure that masks and gloves are put into the right 
uh, receptacles that are sealed and closed. Next slide, please. So to have a quick look at that, um, I've put together a, a small case study on surface hygiene, and this is from one of um, our Intertech facilities following outbreak of several positive cases. Uh, we were operating a, an essential services laboratory during the pandemic, so there was no opportunity for people to work from home. So the, the safety of our staff and the ongoing delivery of essential testing for our customers, you know, such as transformer oils, fuels, lubricants, and these things can't stop. So how do you go about uh, looking at your building's cleanliness prior to and then following disinfection? You know, is it as easy as phoning a phone number and getting a cleaning company to come in and clean your uh, building? Or do you have to take various steps in order to, to assess how, how effective uh, that cleaning is. So we um, initiated a program called the Prevention of Spread of Infection POSI and it checks following prior to and, and post um, cl uh, cleaning and as you can see from the table on the right uh, two generic cleaning programs were, were performed following uh, the pre-disinfection testing both of which failed to meet the requirements um, set down with industry standard for surface cleanliness. And you can see there's things like light switches, door handles, uh, laboratory workbenches, toilets, canteens. Uh, so it wasn't until we first of all went for a high grade chemical performance with a reputable company and also uh, physical cleanings as opposed to aerosol dousing of, uh, of the building that we managed to bring the surface uh, contamination level to within acceptable limits across the building for the most part. Perfect. And then after uh, surface hygiene, looking at building air quality. So initially research indicated that, uh, that surfaces were the main transmission route, as uh, Vibor touched on, that, that you now this is commonly accepted that air quality in a building is equally, if not more important, uh, to making sure that the control is, is well maintained. So as such, good maintenance of air hygiene really has to take on a new level of significance. So having a look at your AC design and operation, is it working well? And that goes both from a cost efficiency perspective as well as a, um, air quality. A routine cleaning, is that something that you do regularly within a building? Perhaps, um, installation of additional hygiene devices within your AC, HEPA filtration, UV sterilizers, as well as ionization, which is something that, um, that, that we've started to do within our facilities uh, within the UAE. And of course, if you do any of these things, then monitoring of the air cleanliness to make sure that these um, steps that have been taken are effective. Next slide, please. Again, we undertook a study in-house within several of our facilities uh, in the UAE. And we set some benchmark testing at the beginning uh, to see where the air quality started at and then did some cleaning as well as installation of some ionization devices. Uh, what we have seen is that even with changing air quality outside, depending on the seasons and the wind strength and any construction around about in the environment that, um, that, that these types of devices can be can be successful where the environment um, was clean. What we have seen in other facilities is that um, the cleanliness of the system at the beginning is hugely important to the operational quality of some of the um, hygiene devices. So if you don't start with a clean canvas for your AC system, it's very difficult to install ionization or HEPA or UV devices that will be effective. So considerations for different sites, just to kind of overview and add in some additional data on top of that is that, you know, obviously spaces that have remained operational and open during the pandemic will have high touch surfaces. So I have to think about these areas and how you can manage them. Some can be engineered out, some have to be cleaned or treated. Air filtration and ventilation, now that could just be, you know, as simple as how does the air system work, but cleaning as well. One area that we're working on at the moment, uh, which we see is a very useful, proactive approach is to look for coronavirus in sewage. Now, typically sick individuals will present positive coronavirus testing from sewage several days prior to presenting symptoms. 
uh, which may manifest themselves as, as coronavirus. So where you have buildings that are being, or have their sewage monitoring, it can be a proactive marker to say, there's a potential in this building where, uh, you know, you may have people with coronavirus. That, that could be useful in schools, uh, particularly in health facilities that are COVID free, then that can allow you to say, oh, actually, we think there may be a potential here. And that can allow you to you know, fast track in some, some screening. Unoccupied spaces. So they, those that have perhaps been shut down during the pandemic, I'm sure several hotels, hospitality venues, which have been completely out of use for, for months, if not you know, over a year now, they're gonna have particularly special needs things like uh, potable water in buildings where occupancy has been down five, 10% of normal water tank storage on site will still have been hundred percent. So turnover and consumption may be several weeks instead of days that can present problems with Legionella water quality inside the building. Uh, again, as Vipor mentioned, indoor air flush out would be uh, something that you would look to do probably alongside cleaning and testing as well. And then, of course, ongoing, we're going to have to change spaces to meet our ongoing future needs, um, occupant use patterns, space redesign, increased social distancing. You know, think about some of the elevators we've stepped into in some of these buildings. I remember, certainly still know um, some of our offices are very tight elevators. So, you know, movement of people is much more difficult. Next slide, please. Okay, and without that, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Mr. John Downey. Thank you, Mike. Um, as uh, Tim alluded to earlier on, uh, my uh, source of speciality is uh, building sciences, and within that, uh, a large percentage of that is, is based around the performance of the building skin or building envelope. And A, what contribution we can make to uh, making buildings more sustainable, but also part of the front line of uh, uh, um, protection against pathogens and COVID. If you, if you look at these uh, um, headliners, um, uh, we're all familiar with at least some, if not all of these uh, 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 processes. However, categorically, um, the uh, performance of a building envelope, the maintenance of a building envelope and its contribution to sustainability and healthy building syndrome uh, um, is it, certainly understated and it generally doesn't form part of uh, uh, processes that we have. There are exceptions to that, but, but as a rule, it's certainly uh, uh, behind the door in relation to being a frontline uh, front activity to help us move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, definitely, and using the envelope in, the, in how it's designed as a skin, as a protection like our own skin, uh, it, it definitely can be in the front line of both prevention and control. And it has, can, and, and must become much more important. It's currently underappreciated, uh, and, and it's, it can be, uh, and I'll allude to it later on, uh, and certainly assist in fighting COVID and any other pathogens that, that come and make us all more comfortable in buildings as we reopen and cities become uh, uh, much more populous again after the various lockdowns around it. Um, of course, in, in the forefront is where areas of mass gatherings, commercial entities, shopping centers, hospitals, universities, uh, our offices and our mass transport systems, they all need looked at uh, looking at and the previous speakers have, have indicated that this is where they need to go but part of that is is and, and it's a much undersought is how the envelope plays a part in that um if we can make assumptions uh, and there are definite assumptions that we can make in that will we go back to uh, everybody working from the offices highly unlikely every study shows that there's going to be a huge drop off in in office space which means uh, um, uh, real estate will become uh, a more competitive area uh, and certainly in the UAE as we become more mature and certainly in Europe which is very mature uh, um, uh, uh, the benefits of having a healthy building as opposed to what has traditionally been and has always been there sick building syndrome certainly across Europe uh, uh, 
become much more uh, in the front and wellness, environmental and resilient systems uh, will, will become the standard. And as Tim indicated earlier on, uh, um, the benefits of having a starred system similar to the hospitality, uh, uh, when you rate your, your green building or your, your renovated building, uh, will become much more important uh, and obviously a, a revenue recognizer uh, moving on. Um, the scenario is obviously then set for green buildings to, to strongly emphasize the benefits of, of uh, again, as Mike has already said, indoor air quality and as Vipnor mentioned, the, the well ventilated spaces. And how do you do that efficiently is, is, is the issue. If, if you need to increase your air changes, uh, um, is it not the, the, uh, the opposite effect that you want that you're using more AC? In fact, it's not. Um, as Mr. Faisal indicated, that uh, certainly in the UAE, and it's, it's, it's really gratifying to see that, that there is a big push towards something that personally I'm passionate about, is the renovation, refit, repurposing, and upgrades to existing buildings. Uh, um, uh, it comes in various formats, but uh, again, it, it, for me uh, and my passion, it's all about uh, um, the recycling of air. And if you're recycling air in a leaky balloon, you'll never, you'll never get it to, uh, to operate properly. Uh, um, and there is no real systematic met methodology out there of, of uh, uh, ensuring the building is airtight. If the building is airtight, uh, air changes become easier, more efficient and simpler. And Vibnor very well made the case for the lack of ventilation uh, was, was cause and effect for spread or non-spread depending on location globally at this current moment. And, and that's, that's, that's there, it's in the science, it's backed up by our own, our own readings. Uh, and it, it, it's improvement of envelope, improvement of, of, of maintenance of envelope, uh, and uh, uh, going back to Mr. Mr. Faisal's point, that Good for morning. me, uh, which are which are renovation, uh, um, you, should be, you should have a yeah. benchmark. You should have a a pretest before you renovate okay. and a post test okay. after you renovate, and okay. therefore you I see how the building air exchange works and how efficient really? the HVAC systems will will contribute towards prevention of, of spread. Uh, new builds will also focus on, on amplifying and augmenting the area using new natural ventilation systems and obviously seeking uh, fresh innovative, innovative uh, ventilation systems as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we've, most people have, have touched on this and we've not showed clearly the uh, increase in ventilation is quickly and, and the reasons are there in front of you, the, the organic material collects on HVAC systems uh, and, and there are various ways using UV and plasma systems to, to um, eliminate that. Uh, it is a statement of fact that most buildings, the heating and ventilation and air conditions so circulate 85 to 90 percent of indoor air. Uh, um, not drawing it from the outside, which is counterproductive to as, as we've shown earlier on. Uh, this needs to change. Um, so again, back to what we discussed earlier on, scrubbed uh, outdoor air needs to be done more, uh, more efficiently. We do that by making sure the building is airtight and it, 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 it drops off your 60% load of, of HVAC system if the air is, site, it, is, is recycled smoother and much more efficiently. Again, just other, other ideas out there. Uh, um, it was, uh, again, enlightening to see that there's a real interest in, in traditional local wind towers, which is a, 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 a proven way uh, with some modern uh, additives to, to recycle your air efficiently and at, at, uh, at uh, low cost, low, and low value. Um, uh, we can adapt systems that are already there in existence for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide testing, such as that was used in car parks now, uh, and they can be added into, into buildings. And um, as new buildings are constructed, they really need to be looked at from a design point of view. Again, back to Tim's introductory point, using the science exemplified by Matt, the research by Vivnor, uh, and the tried and trusted ways of assessing a building and its, and its envelope performance. All can be done prior to after design and prior to prior to commissioning, uh, 
uh, uh, to make sure what you get at the end of the day is an efficient, sustainable green building. Next slide, please. How do we do that? You can do it on, on new buildings and you can do it on old buildings. But basically, it's, it's uh, utilizing ter uh, thermography, which shows anomalies in the building systems. Uh, 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 we've done it on, on multiple buildings locally. Employing air tightness testing, which is similar to blowing up a balloon, but it's the fitment of, of fans on a building, pressurizing it and recording the air loss in it. We, uh, one of the previous slides showed that the, the, the local uh, um, uh, 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 benchmark is 10 meters squared uh, uh, per hour lost through the building. Most buildings can, if they're properly maintained, uh, achieve that and better. Um, indoor air quality tests, which we've discussed on, uh, physical and expert uh, inspections, air barrier testing, which is your vapor barriers within the system prior to testing or assessed assessment prior to design. And then probably one of the most key things for me is preventive maintenance. We all know the buildings around here, we've all put our hands beside windows and, and, and felt hot, hot air coming in. That's a failure of the air barrier system. And as the single biggest investment in any building, be it re renovation or new, uh, the building envelope is the most neglected. It costs more than any other system to put in a building, yet it's the most ignored. Uh, and it can make a serious contribution to a better performing, sustainable and healthy building. Uh, and then localized testing can be done on individual systems within that building. Uh, in summary, I can't understate the value in assessing and constant upkeep and maintenance of your envelope. It is the most neglected system in all buildings and performance checks should be part of every, every uh, facilities management program within the building. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our four speakers from Circo, Eternum, and Intertech, Mr. Vibor, Mr. Tim, Mr. Michael, and Mr. John. Actually, it was a great presentation that uh, has shed the light on some important research findings that you have done globally and locally. So um, it is definitely important to uh, always maintain surface hygiene, ensure proper ventilation, ensure good air quality, because that is how we will ensure that our uh, employees are uh, healthy and safe. So thank you for shedding the light on that. And as you rightly said, sustainability is key uh, right now more than ever. So this is definitely important. I can see a few questions coming uh, in the Q&A box. However, due to time constraint, we will leave them until the Q&A session by the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, thank you once again. So um, we would now welcome our third uh, presentation for today with Mr. Utpal Joshi, Regional Consulting Sales Manager at Daikin Middle East. Mr. Utpal has 27 years of experience in HVAC industry in the GCC, Africa, India, and New Zealand. He has been with Daikin for the last 10 years, serving the Middle East and African market with consulting solutions and green buildings. Mr. Utpal, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and Good morning to everyone. Uh, indeed, it was an interesting, uh, you know, uh, presentations uh, highlighting the current scenario and what are the precautions that has been taken in place. So uh, I would like to take more focus on the indoor air quality. Next slide, please. So when we are talking about uh, what we will talk about is generally indoor air quality and uh, HVAC guidelines, which briefly we will touch upon, and what choices we have uh, in terms of uh, you know, our protection and how we are using our buildings. And we will do a, a short presentation uh, in things on what improvements were done in a building uh, which was recently renovated, uh, which is our headquarters just one year back, we did a green uh, retrofit there. And what is the market reaction, you know, when we are suggesting the IAQ initiatives is what we will look at. Next, please. So when we are talking about uh, indoor air quality, uh, generally we all, uh, always look at indoor air pollution, you know, because this is created by the space that we are using and the materials which is in there. Now the added addition is pandemic time, you know, the pathogen control, how effectively we can protect against the uh, pathogens as well. Next, please. 
so uh, just in, in indoor air quality like indoor air pollution is a silent killer uh, we all know that you know more than 2 million in, in southeast asia alone is because of this poor indoor air quality is what has uh, been killing the people silently over the years uh, next please and uh, if we are looking at um, uh, close to us you know uh, we also have a problem because we have more centralized spaces we spend more time indoors uh, particularly in the harsher climate months and uh, you know our uh, particulate size also varies depending upon the season so this is where indoor air quality issue is not uh, global it is local for us as well uh, next one please and uh, when we are talking about the particle size so you know if you are talking about pm 2.5 pm 10 or pm 1 uh, it's how it affects us as human beings so when we are uh, doing uh, ventilate filtration pm 10 uh, generally we can still you know get it uh, if we get less than 2.5 uh, you know bronchi and bronchiasis this is where it is uh, now we are having the health issue and if it mixes with the bloodstream uh, you know less than microgram and this is where we are having a severe problem so this uh, covid situation you know has highlighted on where also we need to work on next slide please and uh, if we look at it, the size, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the SARS CoV 2 or 19 virus, what is the size in terms of PM 2.5 particle micron, which roughly, you know, would uh, uh, look at in terms of uh, cleanliness of the air? Uh, we are talking about coronavirus as 0.1 micron, uh, you know, so this uh, uh, we use surgical mask, but if uh, normal surgical, not single use face mask, not surgical mask, single use face masks, which we are using is three microns, 95% is what it is, uh, you know, air purifying and surgical mask definitely if US standard uh, following is much better, uh, it's three micron for 95%, but point micron, one micron as well. So this, uh, you know, leads to what we do. N95 definitely even a better protection. So either we need to mask up, you know, this is what we do as a protection. But what we do in the building when we are there, uh, so uh, definitely there are a lot of things that uh, previous speakers did mention all rightly that we need to look at all the measures, you know, uh, including the social distancing and cleaning of the air. Uh, and maybe we need to look at, you know, holistically of what should be the approach. Next slide, please. So we have various measures, like uh, in terms of our air conditioning equipment, uh, what we have for indoor air quality, and mainly it has to do with filtration. So you can go with a range of different filters, you can increase the filtration levels, and definitely you can go with uh, UVC, uh, you know, lamps to kill the microbiological elements or ionizers or streamer technology wherein you can have positive negative ions uh, which is you know deactivating the virus by uh, taking out the protein layer of it so these are the defense what we have uh, currently uh, in hvac systems or in indoor air quality next slide please and generally speaking so what normally we would go what is the pyramid so first definitely uh, protective uh, equipment so mask and all is definitely the right way of doing it and then we put administrative controls not touching or touchless all the other solutions that we have we can engineer some particular solutions we can substitute and we can eliminate so these are the general guidelines that you would follow so that we can have a more protective environment that we can work and live in next slide please so air filtration definitely is one of the key things in that uh, generally we, uh, if we have designed buildings in the last five, seven years, we generally follow ASHRAE 62.1 uh, uh, criteria and uh, definitely it has got a lot of, uh, you know, important stuff. So new buildings are with uh, a very good uh, in terms of indoor air quality if we look at few years back or few decades back. Uh, now uh, the priority once we have the system which is installed how we use it uh, basically at this stage when the pandemic hit uh, the priority was not to conserve energy right it 
nucleus to reduce the uh, transmission of the virus. And uh, efficiency, energy efficiency was the second part. So ASHRAE recommended that we do not, uh, you know, deactivate our HVAC system. There was, you know, the case of uh, the restaurant, which was very famous in China, that it spread coronavirus and should we switch off the AC? But that was not uh, recommended. We need to maintain the temperature. Uh, however, we need to look at how we can interrupt the roots, you know, how we can isolate the zones, because it's clearly it was shown that floor 11 was containing in itself. So uh, now the other part to look at is how we can even dilute our indoor air ventilation, you know, concentration of air so that we can have better indoor air quality. So this is what is general guidance. If we have to just just of what ASHRAE recommended in pandemic, this is what it was there. Next slide, please. And uh, so we go with filtration, right? Uh, more 14 uh, is the filtration efficiency, which uh, was told that we need to operate. So I've just put a microscopic view of it. So what ha actually happens, you know, if you have more eight filters, you can see the amount of space wherein the dust particles can not be arrested. But as you move on to 12, to 14, to 16, your arrests of dust particles is much higher. So the other thing is reusable media is not very good. It is always good to have, uh, you need to take the media, clean it and uh, refill, uh, recharge it or reuse uh, the new one. You cannot use a cleanable one, which is going to pour, you know, have more porous surface after the cleaning. So reusable one is not good. You need to use once and uh, then replace it is much better. And as you can see why HIPAA is better. HIPAA is covering the surface, you know, fully so that it can arrest more particles. So this is where you can see on those things that what is available right now. Next slide, please. Uh, now to take it on a level higher. So just HEPA, great, you know, it will arrest a lot of particles. But if it is, uh, you know, activated with some enzymes, which can, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about the surface like copper and all. So in filter media also, there is lictic exam, which can be incorporated and it can deactivate, it, uh, deactivate the protein layer of the virus. So this can even help, you know, in deactivating the virus as well. So this is, uh, would be a next level of HEPA, you know, if we are looking at into looking at HEPA filtration additional, these are the things that would be available as well. Next slide, please. So uh, all this, uh, we use air handling units or fan coil units, and we have to incorporate this. So generally in a building, you would have a fresh air handling unit for bigger spaces, you might have air handling units. And for smaller areas, for individual spaces, we have fan coil units. Right. So what are the things that is available in the market now? Next slide, please. So when we look at air handling unit, uh, definitely the filtration uh, grade can be upgraded. So MOV 14 uh, uh, is possible if it is possible. Generally, if you have a motor that is with uh, EC fan, you know, or you can upgrade that EC fan and you can have the static pressure that can be adjusted because it will definitely would add to the static pressure loss. So once that adjustment is done and you go for a higher level of filtration, definitely you are now getting a better air. Uh, biocidal filters, uh, you know, is, is possible in bio panel, uh, like, uh, you know, with uh, charged uh, enzymes would be a way to go forward. The other thing uh, is we do have a heat recovery. We are in high ambient zone, you know, T3 uh, zone. So we are talking about very high temperatures. So we do heat recovery. Now, heat recovery wheel, you know, can add uh, the contaminants, it can recirculate. So best way is definitely to isolate the paths. Earlier, we had only four ways, you know, of uh, having uh, the isolation on plate type heat exchanger. Now there are six, the hexagonal type also with a bit more surface, a little bit higher efficiency. So these are the things that is now uh, come into play as well. However, sometimes, you know, uh, you would uh, switch off the heat recovery in non higher uh, areas, non, like we have the good that we had months from October to January, February, you know, where you can have, if you do not have recovery, you are still maintaining your right temperatures, but in summer it's difficult. So this is where you need to look at that. Or 
uh, there would be you know some local solutions like fan call unit sort of units hidden units where you can have a heat transfer with those sort of things so these are the centralized or decentralized solution also that is possible uh, next one please and in terms of fan call unit, uh, what can be done? You know, so yes, definitely you can increase, change the filter, but you cannot go to absolute high because of the fixed fan and the ESP that is available. And you don't want the noise also because it's very close to the usage. So the filtration uh, that is available, yes, just plain UV light upgrade is possible. However, you can add uh, some, uh, you know, catalyst like TiO2, uh, again, to do ionization and UV together, uh, so PCO, uh, UV, ionizer, all these things uh, can give that uh, spray of positive and negative ions, which is going to give you a clean of the air. It's not going to have a on-time protection uh, because there is going to be an emittance of the virus from a body. It can transfer to the next person. It can reach to the next person. It depends upon the air design. However, by adding those measures, you are at least cleaning the air, making it clean. Let's say two hours before the usage of the facility or uh, extending 24 hours protection, you are at least cleaning the air, making sure that the whole facility is remaining clean for a longer time. Next slide, please. And uh, then if you cannot do anything, you know, but still you want to have a pre-filter, carbon filter, a HEPA filter, UV light, TIOC, ionizer, then uh, there are local solutions, uh, you know, which are uh, many manufacturers have uh, put in the market is uh, an air filtration unit, wherein you have all this put together in a box. Uh, and uh, this is a, word, a, a horizontal type uh, for the bigger areas. Next slide, please. Or a vertical type, uh, wherein, you know, you can use this in a big offices, uh, let's say, or in the hotel rooms when the cleaning is happening, this unit can go and sanitize the air. So if you have not put the actual uh, unit uh, of ionization and uh, the higher filtration of UV lamp in every fan coil unit, you are going to do it when you are going to clean it. Well, it's going to take 40 minutes or 60 minutes, depending upon, you know, you can adjust the charge of UV and everything, and you can have a sanitization of the room at that time also. So this is another uh, measure like in schools, you know, yeah, or in big uh, mosque and prayer halls, when people will come in, go back, and you have this uh, units that is movable. So this, uh, our local need solution also is made available by a number of manufacturers. Uh, next, please. Or in our home, there are air purifiers, uh, which is uh, available with all those technologies as well. Next, please. And uh, it depends now, uh, as we rightly looked at earlier, is how we use, you know, our uh, facility is becoming more uh, crucial. So definitely controls, uh, active cleaning, and uh, looking at uh, you know measurements is also very very important uh, and more localized zones you have cross contamination could be reduced as well next slide please and uh, the best thing is definitely if it can be improved uh, the in indoor air uh, quality can be improved by adding more ventilation that would be one of the best thing by dilution uh, and active, uh, you know, upgrade of filtration would be a great step as well. Next slide, please. Now, uh, and uh, adding wherever it is not possible, adding local cleaning, you know, uh, items and frequented areas uh, is more important because this is where most of the time, you know, the exchange could take place. So uh, that is possible even uh, creating negative zones. This is more on a hospital side, but uh, on a general places, it is more on a, on a recirculating type, cleaning uh, apartments would be the key to look at it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the best way uh, as uh, you know, when we are supplying the air, uh, it can come back from different sources, like an air handling unit from different rooms. The best way is to treat it, uh, you know, with uh, biocide filters so that we are now, whatever air is coming, because it's going to go to different rooms, we are not going to cross-contaminate it. 
So this could be one of the key things to look at uh, on the return side, you know, when you're collecting it and making sure that the air is properly cleaned before again, it's going back in the recirculation mode. Next slide, please. So uh, we, uh, our office is located in Jabsa. Next slide, please. So this uh, is, a, is a one year old facility. Uh, we had uh, all the filtration, you know, a big uh, air handling unit uh, with double wheel recovery uh, and state of the art uh, technologies, whatever is available as of date is installed. You guys are more than welcome. Anyone would like to see it, we can definitely showcase that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, basically, uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, you have to have a lot of general precautions. So uh, when uh, the pandemic hit, definitely, you know, uh, as per the local regulations, we looked at it and to save the business, uh, we had two groups, 50-50, and we even reduced that further to 30%, you know, work from home was encouraged, visitor control was very much controlled. Uh, and uh, restricted entries were uh, in place, uh, temperature checks, meeting rooms with restricted entries, and active disinfection, which is the key, you know, of surfaces that are touched uh, many times, uh, has to be done on a regular basis. So this was some general uh, things that were appointed. Next one. On the technical side, what we did was our fresh air handling unit uh, is with the EC fan. So we were able to raise the capacity by another 20%. And we made it 24 hours working. Earlier for energy savings, we were using it for 12 hours. So this is what uh, we made it uh, to have better you know, disinfection by adding more outside air as recommended by ASHRAE. And uh, central control. Uh, was implemented so that none of the thermostats, you know, people were touching it or they were fully disabled to uh, stop the changing of the settings as well. And heat recovery wheel, in, when the weather was not good, again, we have started now, uh, but uh, it was stopped so that we can have uh, no mixing of uh, the air from exhaust and the supply side. Uh, FHU is, uh, is, is running more hours, uh, 24 hours now. Filtration definitely was upgraded, as rightly said, uh, to more 14 and to disposable type. Uh, and uh, in the small meeting rooms, air purifiers were installed because this is what uh, we thought that it's an additional precautions we need to do it. And the big uh, movable type uh, air purifier was installed in a big public place and open areas as well. And next, please. And uh, now, uh, you know, we were suggesting, so what is happening in the market uh, in terms of design uh, side, uh, what is changing uh, in design nowadays? So uh, definitely we were following ASHRAE 62.1, indoor air quality per person, fresh air, everything was there. But now, uh, but we were not seeing UV lamp, you know, now that is being accepted that yes, let's have space for it if we install now or in future. So that's that's being done on a lot of projects. Uh, filtration rate has been increased uh, so that we can have you know a bit more air changes also. And uh, more of 14 and all this uh, standard uh, you know has been raised to a higher filtration level as well. Uh, plate type heat exchangers uh, were looked at, but when many times you have constraint on space, you know. Uh, and the recovery rate is not great enough, then you don't get enough credit for green building. So this is what is again looking at one of the key factors also of the recovery rate and uh, the control strategy, uh, flushing uh, of the air after hours, you know, IQ monitoring. This is these are all welcome steps that is being looked at so that in new projects also we further improve the indoor air quality. Uh, in retrofit projects, uh, basically old facilities where uh, outdoor air, you know, was limited. Uh, this is where they are lo more uh, looking at it because uh, the indoor air quality is worse. But the first thing is measure. If you don't measure it, you don't know it, how bad it is. So this uh, is, is very, very important, as rightly said uh, by Michael uh, and everyone before. Uh, on uh, facilities, uh, which is recently made, uh, uh, complying to the regulations, the indoor air quality is considered to be uh, okay, and the airflow rates can be increased. So, you know, filtration is upgrade is looking being looked at, uh, but uh, not you know uh, 
IAQ uh, as, as, as a big uh, uh, requirement because still the awareness. So I think the key thing is the measurement and uh, recommendation of what is possible. That awareness comes in as in when we can see more and more IAQ upgrades. So I think that would be it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Utpal, for this uh, great presentation and for taking us through the various indoor air quality solutions that you have. Uh, indeed, air, indoor air quality is a very important aspect that we need to focus on, especially nowadays during the pandemic and even later, even post pandemic indoor air quality will always remain an important uh, and a crucial um, element of green buildings. So thank you very much for this, Mr. Utpal. And now up to our last but not least uh, speaker, Mr. Bias Babi, Senior Energy Consultant at Farnik. Mr. Bias has more than 10 years of experience in the fields of energy and consultancy. He has a strong background in green buildings, indoor air quality monitoring and management, and energy management plans. He has conducted more than 100 energy audits in various commercial buildings. Over to you, Mr. Bias. Thank you, Fatima, for the introduction. Uh... Before starting, uh, just to give you a, a brief introduction about Farnak. Farnak is UAE is one of the leading uh, technology and sustainability driven facility management service provider uh, with uh, 40 years of operation in UAE. So in spite of COVID-19, Farnak has been at the forefront of uh, sustainability in the FM industry in UAE. And Farnak has recently constructed a state of art uh, staff accommodation building in Jebel Ali, uh, which is accommodating uh, around 5,000 employees. In line with our uh, sustainability initiatives, we have adopted green building concepts for our new staff accommodation building. And here in this presentation, I will be briefing about the various uh, sustainability initiatives we have implemented at our uh, facility and uh, the challenges we have faced during this ongoing pandemic uh, during this implementation phase. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, we know that the importance of sustainability for built environment has increased during this pandemic period. Uh, we can see a considerable number of uh, studies uh, or papers published on uh, sustainability for uh, normal uh, residential properties or commercial offices or malls, etc. But one area which is the staff accommodation or low income accommodation where a considerable number of UAE population lives has uh, not been seen with in much studies associated with the sustainability. So Farnak being a pioneer in FM industry has shown its uh, initiatives and commitment towards sustainability for its clients. And Farnak is now exhibiting the same commitment for its newly built staff accommodation, which is named as Farnak Village. Here is a brief about the Farnak Village. It's a 500,000 square feet facility uh, with the staff accommodation, library, leisure room, and many more. So uh, moving to the next slide. Yeah. These are the basic concepts we have adopted uh, for our staff accommodation. And pandemic, since pandemic being the prime concern, our major focus was on the indoor environmental quality. In addition to that, we have taken uh, concepts, uh, green building concepts, to improve our energy efficiency, water efficiency, and the waste management systems and all. So I'll be uh, dis discussing all these uh, concepts detailly in the coming slides. Moving to the next slides. Yeah. <clears throat> indoor environmental health and important consideration for uh, Farnak village. <laughs> Indoor environmental health uh, is a very critical aspect for residential built environment. As we all know that uh, we spend more than 90% of our time in indoors. Here in our Farnak village, uh, near about, or more than 50% of the time, the staff spend, uh, spend their time in, uh, indoors. In, in, indoors in the sense, in uh, inside Farnak village. So major health problems identified uh, are identified with people who are living in this poor and, uh, environmental conditions. So hence, it is our primary responsibility to provide a healthy and indoor and when, uh, healthy indoor environmental condition for our staff. Our prime focus was on the indoor air quality and uh, we have adopted uh, better ventilation systems in line with the green building standards and various air conditioning standards. A demand-based ventilation system is already in place uh, for the uh, Farnak village and where the carbon dioxide will be monitored continuously to ensure sufficient fresh air is provided for the inmates. And IAQ parameters we are monitoring on a periodic basis and uh, most of the IAQ parameters are well within, within the allowable limits as per the various standards. Here in the table we can see uh, the ventilation rates uh, and corresponding standards. Uh, we are providing a ventilation rate of uh, approximately around 14 liters per second per person 
whereas the minimum uh, recommended as per rational standard is around 2 to 3 liters per second per person and 0.3 liters per second per square meter so here in the graph you can see a carbon dioxide profile in the room during the night uh, night time when the room occupancy is maximum so the co2 levels are mostly uh, well below more, more than 90% of the time you can see the co2 levels well below the uh, <clears throat> allowable limits of around 800 ppm this is basically because of the higher ventilation rates we are providing for the uh, accommodation rooms so the importance of higher ventilation rates in line with the uh, ongoing pandemic i am explaining in the next slide next slide please yeah so um, the pandemic was a big realization uh, on the importance of maintaining indoor environment since our accommodation was housing large number of staff working in uh, various uh, sites so we understood the risk and undertook immediate actions to ensure that our people are safe and uh, we are providing a healthy uh, environmental condition for them so actions were implemented and systems are adjusted as per the recommendations uh, and guidelines from various bodies such as world health organization asha and cdc here are few measurements uh, measures we have implemented uh, to contain the spread of viruses in indoor environment so uh, you can see a graph there uh, in the left hand side uh, which is from asha journal which is showing a relationship between air changes and the common cold infection in a dormitory so uh, here we can see that when the air changes is uh, increasing you can see the uh, infection rates is dropping down so when uh, uh, your air changes is above 1.3 your uh, rate of infection for the common cold is dropped below 5 percentage so keeping this in mind we are providing our maximum uh, possible air changes to our facility which is maximum possible from our existing system is around which is 3.1 per hour so we have removed our demand based uh, ventilation system for the staff accommodation so that we are providing the maximum fresh air supply to the room and we are minimizing the uh, we are diluting the contamination rates inside the uh, facility in addition to that uh, we are trying to maintain our room humidity levels between 40% to 60% uh, where the virus virus spread is minimum uh, this is as per the guidelines from uh, cdc then uh, periodic filter cleaning are done to improve our uh, filtration effectiveness in ahus and fcus so that uh, a better indoor environmental conditions we are maintaining inside the rooms in addition to that uh, we are uh, doing a flushing of air uh, before the occupied period in common areas common area ahus so flushing time we are uh, decided based on the various trials we have conducted with the systems by observing the deterioration of uh, the contamination so we have uh, conducted enormous amount of studies for individual systems and the flushing time is adjusted according to that so moving to the next slide yeah so the sanitization measures uh, we were focused more on mitigating contamination of indoor environment and the spreading of contamination from person to person uh, additional care has been given for the cleaning and disinfection activities so we have uh, implemented couple of smart disinfection gates uh, to uh, provide the uh, smart disinfection uh, gates are provided for, uh, for for our facility to disinfect people when they are entering into the facility in addition to that uh, frequent fogging and disinfection activities are carried out uh, in our facility to eliminate the contamination through the larger droplets and special cleaning staff is employed in each floors to maintain the minimum required uh, indoor cleanliness in addition special cleaning activities are carried out along with the routine maintenance activities which is which minimizes the vsc emission from the chemical uh, cleaning chemicals which adds to our indoor air quality uh, uh, parameters moving to the next slide so uh, lighting comfort is the next parameter we have considered from the ieq parameter so we have installed almost around the 4000 energy efficient led lamps in farnak village and illumination levels are provided as per the sipc uh, standards uh, as the illumination levels affect the physio psychological well being of uh, our occupants so um, in addition to that common area lamps are provided with uh, uh, motion sensors so that uh, uh, demand based lighting is provided for the common areas in addition to that daylight harvesting harvesting system is provided in the common area to reduce our electrical energy consumption for lighting application here in the picture you can see one skylighting system we have provided for our one of our common area <clears throat> yeah move to the next slide uh, efficient water management system uh, is the next feature feature we have installed in our farnak village so uh, water efficient fixtures uh, with the water flow rates as per the required standards are provided to reduce our water consumption in addition to that we have provided a uh, couple of uh, uh, sorry uh, we have provided aerators to reduce our uh, optimize our water consumption in the wash basin tanks 
So here we can see that water usage index uh, for our facility, which is 81 liters per person per day. So if we check for uh, uh, the similar facilities in UAE, like staff accommodation or dormitories or hotel hostels, we can see this, uh, this is in the range of around 85 to 95 liters per person. So we can say that we, are, we have a better water usage index compared to the similar facilities in uh, UAE. Next slide, please. In addition to this, we have a condensate water recovery. So we are expecting around uh, 10 meter cube of uh, condensate generation from the uh, our AC system. So this condensate we are planning to utilize for our um, uh, cleaning activities. In addition to that, we are we are going to utilize this uh, condensate recovered for um, irrigation purpose as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, effective waste management system in line with uh, green building standards are implemented in Farnak Village. So recycling bins in each corridors are provided to encourage uh, waste segregation in worker room. And in addition to that, our major waste is coming from uh, um, the food waste. So expected waste generation is approximately around 250 kg per day. And we are going to have a uh, composting machine for composting this uh, uh, food waste. A portion of this food, uh, compost will be used, for, used as a manual for our vertical garden. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, as part of Farnak's Sustainable uh, Circular Economy Initiative, we are implementing a rooftop vertical garden in Farnak Village, which utilizes the manure from uh, food composter and water from the condensate recovery system. So the condensate recovery system, uh, the water from condensate recovery system will be utilized for uh, irrigation purpose and the misting application for providing the climatic control in the greenhouse. And we are aiming almost around seven to 10 tons of green leafy vegetable per year from the system as a fresh organic food for our staff. And this existing system is almost 90% more water efficient uh, than the conventional farming and aquaponics. Now the system uh, are implemented and the first set of seedlings will be uh, shifted from the nursery to the vertical garden. And we are expecting our first harvest by the end of this June uh, this year. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we have uh, implemented some uh, renewable energy measures our, in our Farnak village. And we have uh, uh, roof mounted solar water heater system, which will be generating around 75% of our uh, facility total hotel wa uh, hot water requirement. In addition to that, uh, we are planning for a solar PV power generation system with a capacity of around 700 kilowatt peak. And uh, with this, we are expecting to have a a uh, renewable energy mix of around 16 percentage after the installation of this uh, solar generation in our uh, facility. Next slide, please. So the next one is a sustainable transportation initiative. We have introduced the green bike for our home maintenance team, which is nothing but electric bike. So previously we were utilizing passenger cars or vans for uh, uh, commuting the maintenance team. Now with the introduction of this uh, green bike, we are expecting a CO2 reduction of approximately around 10 tons per year per bike. In addition, uh, a biodiesel station we are planning, uh, B20, which is nothing but 80% uh, 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 diesel and 20% biodiesel for our Farnak uh, buses and vans, which will have a better fuel efficiency and so that uh, we will have a reduced CO2 emission from our uh, transportation. Next slide, please. So this is the performance indicator for uh, the Farnak village based on the current uh, uh, energy consumption and water consumption, we arrived at an energy utilization index of around 167 kilowatt hour per meter square per annum. But so far, we don't have any detailed studies on worker accommodation energy consumption patterns. So we are comparing this with uh, uh, the residential facilities in uh, Dubai, which has uh, a kilowatt hour per meter square per annum value in the range of 95 to 200. So we are in middle of that. And uh, we are planning to have some ESCO projects. So our plan is to reduce our energy consumption by 10%, reduce 10 percentage by this December 2021. In addition to that, uh, water utilization index, I have explained before that uh, we have a water, better water utilization index compared to the similar facilities in uh, uh, <clears throat> Middle East region. Uh, that's all from the uh, initiatives we have implemented. Now, uh, moving to the next slide which is the challenges due to this pandemic and actions. So the major challenges, what most of this implementation happened during this uh, COVID period. And the major challenges we have uh, faced are this uh, delay in shipment. So to counter that, what we did is we adopted a local sourcing of goods and subcontractors to reduce the effects of this slowdown. Actually, our plan was to complete this project by this uh, mid of last year, but uh, we were able to complete only by the end of uh, November, November 2020. 
So in addition to that, we had issues with the shortage of workforce. So to counter that, we utilized our own uh, workforce and diversified the shift timing to compensate this uh, delay in material supply. And uh, the next issue was the health and safety. So to providing a better health and uh, safe, safe environment in the uh, construction site, we moved our most of our business practices to electronic means to reduce this physical and face-to-face uh, -face contacts. In addition to that, frequent uh, PCR tests are carried out for the uh, subcontractors and the workers who are working in our construction sites. <clears throat> That's the, that is from the uh, uh, installation period. Now from the operation period, uh, the energy intensive operation. So the basic issue what we faced was that uh, due to the higher uh, uh, pressure circulation and the increased uh, focus on this air conditioning system, our energy bills were on the higher side. So we did some trials uh, uh, on our HVAC systems by optimizing, uh, by, by studying the uh, rate of deterioration of our uh, contam uh, contaminants inside the rooms, but with the different flow rates and different uh, fresh air su uh, supply and a different opening of uh, outside air damper. So based on that, we have optimized uh, our energy consumption, uh, consumption to a certain level and uh, many more studies are going on and we are expecting to reduce our energy consumption further below than the current consumption levels. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Bias, for actually taking us through this Farnak Village project that you implemented despite the pandemic. And uh, obviously, there are a number of great uh, green building measures that you have implemented uh, to make sure that the building is sustainable and environmental friendly. Thank you very much for this. Now, uh, we'll take a very few questions due to time constraints. So if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, the first question that was regarding uh, the controls in place to ensure um, uh, cooling providers act responsibly. Um, while Mr. Faisal was only able to address it from a macro level. Uh, however, when it comes to controls, maybe Mr. Otpal can shed some light on this, on some indoor air quality solutions or some AC um, cooling. Uh, Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, definitely, uh, this is government. Uh, every uh, there are there will be set KPIs, so uh, the cooling providers should take the responsibility for their operations. Saying that uh, in real life, uh, it could be challenging because of the complex situations that uh, we are in. But uh, uh, in general, uh, as we look at it, you know, the uh, quality of building indexes, uh, which is going to come uh, in terms of energy performance. So I hope uh, this would be one of the points when you are rating a building from government side also, that would help uh, in, in doing that. So yes, this is a hope uh, that we will have that. Thank you, Mr. Utpal. Um, we are, if, if there is any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box. Um, we have one question on the impact of revolving entry or exit doors um, being, being semi-contained spaces. So is this something that we would recommend? Um, I would direct this to uh, Circo and their knowledge partners, perhaps based on their research, um, uh, they could shed some light on this. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Fatma. Uh, I think, I, for, first of all, revolving doors are generally not the most efficient manner of, of, uh, of, of sealing off the building. I, I think we all know that There's, there isn't any gasketry uh, uh, to provide any air tightness. It's, it's usually done by a brush, which is obviously very permeable. Um, there are ways to get around that. You can build a vestibule inside or outside the revolving door. Uh, and probably more, uh, if, if you really do need, uh, or it is part of the building with, with a revolving door, uh, um, the, the best way really is to keep the building positively charged. Uh, so you balance your HVAC system, so the, the transit of air is from the inside, inside out, rather than the other way around. But um, it's not, uh, revolving doors are generally not efficient, but uh, as I mentioned earlier on, the, the doors in any in any um, uh, facade system or envelope system are, are, are the weakest point. Uh, but most single door closures have good seals on them, but it, it revolving doors by their nature and are not the best manner to, uh, to control the environment, certainly within the lobby. Hope that answers it. 
That is true. Thank you very much. Um, we have, if we don't get any other questions, then we will conclude the webinar. All right, so thank you very much to all our speakers who are here with us today. Um, we have uh, definitely uh, touched upon a very important topic of uh, COVID-19 and how it impacted commercial green buildings. So thank you very much to all our speakers. It was a pleasure having them on board. And thank you